reach the future envisioned in John's book, we need to travel le less and more lightly, to make changes in our diets involving less red meat and carbon intensive food, to, to demand more localism and less industrial scale in food production, and more than anything else to demand that fossil fuels stay in the ground. This must be accompanied by an acknowledgement of our complicity in the health and other impacts being suffered by those in developing countries due to our profligate emissions. And this calls for a paradigm shift and a culture change in almost all of the taken for granted aspects of our lives. Welcome, Alex. Uh, thank you. I'm going to hand over to John O'Brien, who is the uh, key player here. He's the editor of the book that is before you tonight. He says it's not a book launch. He's an entrepreneur and a man who has been involved in clean tech in his home area, which is in Australia, all over Australia, and in, in Asia more generally. Um, he's an engineer by training and has been involved in the world of finance. Um, he's launched, he quotes, this book in a variety of different countries. It's uh, the first of a series and it's about vision. He is a visionary, therefore, and I'd like to invite him to take the chair. John. Good evening. Uh, wonderful to be here in Dublin. And what I might do is uh, with the, the panelists. Hello, panelists. Um, we've got some people standing at the back, so do you want to grab those chairs and then people standing at the back, if you want to come and sit down here, there are a few seats down the front, so um, uh, we'll, be, we'll be chatting for a little while, so um, do, do come and grab a seat if you want. Um, welcome, uh, it's lovely to be here, there are some seats down the front, come and, come and take them. Um, I want to tell you a story about storytelling. Um, There's a lot of us undoubtedly work in the environment industry, and it can be an incredibly frustrating process working in the environment industry. Um, you know, why are people not taking action in something that seems so rational, so sensible? Why are they not seeing what you can see? Are they really that stupid? Are they that selfish? Are they that greedy? Why are they not doing something? One of the things, the assumptions behind that is that there's rational arguments, and people hear rational arguments, and people are rational. And the fault in that argument is that actually people are not rational. We know we're not rational. People are emotional first. So rational environmental communications are actually futile. And so a lot of environmental communications to date have been futile. So we all know that most of us here, and, uh, and most scientists in the world, action on climate change is entirely rational. But we're struggling to address it as a, as a community and a, as a species. And the science tells us that the implications of that, of what's, what's being said, of what's happening, are going to be really catastrophic. We're going to have hundreds of millions of people on the move, hundreds of millions of people dying. But we're still not really doing anything. This is the town of Deir Ezzor in, uh, in northern Syria. Um, I lived in this town for a year in the early 90s, and it was a beautiful agricultural town on the banks of the Euphrates, uh, a well-educated population, good schools, not particularly rich, but it was a very positive, tolerant, uh, interesting town. It had one expat bar that I ended up running, but oh, that's probably another story. <laughs> um, but there was a drought in the late 2000s that led to the collapse of the agriculture. It was an agricultural town. Um, and this, along with a number of other towns in that area, uh, led to the collapse of the community. A lot of people left those towns. They went to the outskirts of the bigger cities, lived in shanty towns. Uh, and someone came along and said, hey, I've got an idea. You know, let's have a revolution. So not entirely caused by climate change, but you know, we, we know where that's led with ISIS and with terrorism on the rise. Um, but certainly contributed to by climate change. So whilst I live in sunny little Adelaide, and you live in beautiful Dublin, um, and maybe climate change doesn't feel like it's going to really affect you yourself, 
the impact of having hundreds of millions of refugees around the world and a lot of people, a lot of inequality, and a lot of people upset actually is going to impact your life in a very big way. Bless you. This is partially locked in. We're actually we're there on that, on this trail already. So our choice is now, is how much more suffering do we really want to cause? We have the solutions. I work with the technology solutions. We have the finance, there's plenty of money around. There's wonderful rational arguments. Rational arguments abound. But how do we attract people to a different future from where we go? So historically, for environmental problems, this is the way we attack it. People get sick, people die, we start complaining, we feel threat, we make the authorities change the rules. And that works really, really well when the impact, impacts are immediate, and the suffering is immediate, and we can turn things around really quite quickly. But where it's gradual and non-imminent, it, this doesn't work. Shouting louder does not get you heard any better. In rich countries, like Ireland, like Australia, climate, rich people generally will fear climate action more than climate change. Maybe not the people in this room, but actually most people in the community will fear climate action more than climate change. That's not rational, but it is real. So what's missing from this? Storytelling. Storytelling inspires great changes. It attracts people to a better future. It doesn't scare them. It doesn't try to scare them. It builds support for a paradigm shift. A paradigm shift in the, in the true sense of the word, which was coined by Thomas Kuhn in, I think, 1962, um, and his theory was basically that when big changes happen, it's never away from something that doesn't work. It's never because it doesn't fit. That paradigm doesn't fit. It's always towards something that fits better. So you have to move towards a paradigm that fits better. So if you tell people that the end of the world is nigh, unless maybe it's this afternoon, they're not going to care. If you tell people, how about we build a better world for your grandchildren, then they care and they engage. So if you think of the stories from your childhood, the ones that grasped you most, that grasp is not rational. And it really underpins the values and the assumptions you have of some of your life. If you come to the pub later, I'll tell you what my childhood stories were. <laughs> so how do we tell stories that have the same power of those and the way, in a way that delivers us avoiding all the bad stuff that's coming and actually to build a world worth living in and lives worth living. How do we use storytelling? There's some wonderful psychological basis to, to this as well. So there's, there's a lot of psychological theory that supports some of these thoughts. Professor Dan Gilbert at, the, at Harvard University, Professor of Psychology at Harvard University, has spoken a lot and written about why the brain is hardwired not to react to climate change. So we're hardwired to react to four things, and we do it really, really well. So if things are intentional, if someone's trying to hurt you or trying to do something, you will react really badly to that. If things are immoral, whatever immoral might mean in that day, in that place, if things are immoral, you will react to that. You know, that's wrong, really wrong. If they're imminent, you will react to that. And if they're instantaneous, you will react to that. And climate change doesn't get any of those. Unless maybe you live in Kiribati, where it feels pretty Im imminent. And unless maybe you read a little bit too much about Exxon Mobil, and then maybe it feels intentional. Um, but Dan Gilbert says, because it fails to trip the brain's alarm, it actually leaves us soundly asleep in a burning bed. And in my view, imminence is actually the greatest challenge of all here. So if someone throws a baseball at your head, you will avoid it. It's amazing. How do humans do that? You know, you won't see it, you don't know it's coming, but you will avoid it. But as a race, we feel no pressure to avoid a significantly greater but non-imminent threat. But there is some good news. Imminent threats are on the increase. <laughs> so Cyclone Pam, Super Typhoon Haiyan, Cyclone Winston, you know, they're, they're starting to kill people, and, and overall, for the human race, that's really quite good news. It is going to drive more action. Maybe not good if you live in the Philippines, but, you know, overall, it, maybe it's good. You know, there's no doubt that we will change. 
There's going to be enough death and catastrophe coming that we will change. But the way we've sort out, sorted out other previous problems, so the smog of London in the 1950s, Los Angeles in the 80s, and Beijing today, where, uh, where I've coughed a lot, um, the standard operating procedure of suffer, threat, change is not going to work. Climate change is gradual and it's not local. It's not going to kill all of us, but it will take out one or two billion. The standing operating procedure is not sufficient for climate change. <coughs> so we need to find something else that works. And we've all kind of seen, seen or read this sort of thing. So, you know, how, how do we make decisions? How do we help people make the right decisions? The left brain, wonderfully rational, linear, logical, you know, the engineers and the accountants. The right brain, creative, emotional, lateral. Um, and we all know that when you go and buy a pair of shoes, or a pair of glasses, or, or go and get your hair cut, not a lot of that is rational decision making. You, know, that's, you kind of go, okay, hey, I'm going to look really cool in that. Or, yeah, it has a little bit of rationality. It's got to be, it's got to cost more than that much. That's maybe not rational, but less than that much, maybe that's rational. So you know when you make personal decisions that the decisions are almost all emotional. But then it comes to business and finance, and sometimes politics, but maybe not always, um, that you think, oh, there's a business case. There's clearly a business case, so it's, been, it's a rational, rational decision. But in business and finance, there's always still the gut feel at the end. And the gut feel is the right brain just chucking in that emotional filter, the emotional input at the end. How do you feel about that? Climate science is wonderfully rational, and that's not enough. So we need to use some emotion, and fear is one of the emotions. Um, John, what, what were they? The, uh, your group? The doomsters. The doomsters, yes. So the doomsters, <laughs> for instance. <laughs> <laughs> <That's reliable> <laughs> <laughs> so we need to use fear. So if we tell people that we're going to have a six degree rise, that there's one metre of sea level coming, that in Little Adelaide we're going to have six weeks over 50 degrees C, is that going to give enough fear to drive action? The problem with fear is that it's chemical and it works really, really well for imminent threats. So you know that when you're scared, that the fight or flight reaction. So that imminence, it works brilliantly. Fear works brilliantly for fight or flight. But it's short term. You know, it's kind of seeps. If it's long term, it kind of comes anxiety and then well, you know, Neighbours comes on, and you just kind of go, oh, well, I'll just watch Neighbours, or I won't worry about it. <laughs> Fear provides the rational argument, but it's not enough. It's not enough on its own. So the other type of emotion is a positive psychology. And that can build hope and attraction towards a better future. Martin Seligman coined the term, also, just his view was it actually leads to permanent changes in how your brain is wired. So the fear reaction is chemical and temporary, and the dream reaction is electrical and permanent. So not only will storytelling attract people towards a better future, the changes we make are actually going to be permanent. And then optimism. There's a whole lot of, a lot of wonderful psychology studies on optimism. I'm an incredibly stubborn optimist, and it's caused me an awful lot of trouble. But it's essential for change. If you have optimism, you have resilience, and you see hurdles not as impassable roadblocks, but rather just temporary setbacks we need to find another way. So actually just having a vision of a better world may well result in the world being better. And finally, I do a lot of work with entrepreneurs, and actually we're the entrepreneurs of the world. We're testing the world's limits. No one knows where we're going. No one knows how this is going to have turn out. So actually, maybe we need to learn from successful entrepreneurs. And the repeated successful entrepreneurs have an effectual worldview. They don't find or predict the future, they create it. What resources have we got? And they create a future that they want. So how about we create the future that we really want? So 18 months ago, I started asking people for visions, and there were three criteria. For the visions. It had to be of the year 2100. And you either had to be looking out the window of the day, what was happening in the year 2100, or kind of thinking back about how the journey we did in the, over the last 85 years. And the reason it was 2100 
was because it was away from the constraints of what was possible. You know, it doesn't matter about whether Tony Abbott's there or not. You see, he's gone. You know, it's kind of it's, it's about what you really want, not about the politics of the day or about what's possible, what technology exists. You know, it's no constraints. There had to be less than 200 words, which some of the authors did, um, and that cut out the waffle. You know, just get to the point. What do you really want? Um, and, and yeah, sitting, sitting in the year 2100 looking out the window, and I asked them, quite a lot of people, I asked about 200 people, and there were quite a lot of people who didn't bother replying. And I think in the long run, they'll, uh, they will regret it. So, um, so President Obama didn't even bother coming back to me. <laughs> Tony Blair, you know, there's a big that he didn't bother replying. The Dalai Lama, he would have written the most beautiful one, didn't reply. <laughs> I really annoyed my family 18 months ago by spending most of Christmas Day trying to find an email address for the Pope. Um, he doesn't have an email address, he does have a Twitter account. I mean, there's a lot of followers on that. Um, but I did get to Archbishop Alza, the number three of the Catholic Church in, uh, in New York, and he said, yeah, sure. So I ended up with uh, 80 bishops. I had 30, 33 from Australia, 16 from Asia, 16 from Europe, and 15 from the Americas. And there's some wonderful stories about technology, about investment, cities, communities. How do we measure wealth in the year 2100? What's that mean? There's talk by quite a few of them of the great climate crisis and what we went through at that time. And, and one author looked back at 2015 and, and talked of the time thieves, the, the generation that didn't act quick enough. And we got some wonderful visions. So Mary Robinson, um, uh, who some of you may know, um, wrote a wonderfully simple, quite short view of what she really wanted. It was a sim simple, beautiful vision. Christiana Figueres um, came across as a wonderful optimist, and running the UNFCCC process, you'd need to be an optimist, and uh, thank God she was to get the result that she did, which was, which was excellent, um, and uh, definitely an optimist. Bill McKibben, who some of you may know, who runs 350.org in the, in the US, um, is never particularly come across as an optimist to me, and, uh, and he kind of proved it with this. Um, and his, his final sentence was, uh, it hurts to think that we blew it. <laughs> so there's no question in my mind that the world will change. The question is how much damage are we going to do on the way? In my view, storytelling, storytelling brings forward that change. It means we can change before we get to the brink of collapse. And in doing so, maybe we'll save millions of lives, countless species and their ecosystems, countless communities and their own stories. And all by telling a few stories. It seems like a worthwhile pursuit. So here's the rational summary. Uh, climate action entirely rational. Decisions are primarily emotional. Fear does not change long-term behaviours and positive storytelling attracts people to a better world. So we're all solved. That was it. Easy. But there is one final hurdle we've got to get up over. So I've got 80 visions. I'm starting to get a few more, as I'll tell you in a minute. Um, but we need a lot more. So many of you have seen this about technology adoption. Once you get to about 16% of people doing something, then everyone does it. So we just need 16% of people sharing their visions. So instead of 80 visions, if I had maybe 80 million, that would give me 1% of the world population. And so you need to, I'll break it down by region. So maybe if we do North America, just 85 million in North America, 81 million in, in Europe, and just 4 million in Australia. As a feasible, as, is that a feasible dream? Well, I'm a stubborn optimist, so I can only say yes. So your mission is now to write your own vision. It's really quite hard to think about what really do you want in the future. And it sometimes challenges your priorities of what you do today and how you live your own life now. Um, and to be worthwhile, it has to be shared. There's no point just writing it and sticking it away quietly somewhere. You have to share it with your friends and your family and your colleagues. You are the storyteller. You're the only one, you're, the only way to have the future that you want is to create it. 
say you put it on the website, you know, people are uploading their visions from all over the world. I had a wonderful one from some guy in India yesterday who popped it up there, so it was well, that's really good. Or you can fill out one of those postcards that your city got and uh, hand it back or, or send it back. And by doing that, then we will end up with a lot of visions and, uh, and we'll see where we go. Now what I was I've not wanted to do in the book was to write my own vision. I wanted to rely on all these clever people. Um, but my wife told me I had to. So, uh, um, so I do always do what my wife says. So I'm not going to read the whole of my vision, but I'm just going to read the, the last little bit of it. And then I'm going to hand over to, to our other speakers. In the year 2100, education is entirely based around systems thinking, commonwealth, and emotional comprehension. Medics under, better understand the human physiology and can finally control the debilitating chronic pain suffered by my wife. Of course, we still have problems. Human greed is still there, and people abuse the system. Criminal convictions for avarice are, however, starting to decline as the new global culture gets bedded down. Equity and justice remain the primary concerns for our global authorities. In 2100, humans have emerged from the chrysalis of the Industrial Revolution and are at last starting to reap the real benefits of progress. Our culture of sharing dream, dreams and creating one's own future has finally given people the freedom of being human, of being free at last. Thank you. So that's me. And now we've got four wonderful speakers. Um, one of whom, our first speaker, uh, also wrote in the book. Um, and I've kind of challenged them to, to think about the future and uh, maybe have their own vision, and we'll see, we'll see what comes. So, um, so first up, um, I'd, I'd like to introduce John Gibbons, who I'm sure many of you know. Um, uh, is a, a journalist, wrote in the Irish Times a lot, I think. Um, and uh, he also, the last time, I've only met John once, um, and, uh, and that was at the Paris Climate Change Conference. Um, and we had a very fun evening afterwards. Um, uh, so, uh, so I'm looking forward to later on this evening and see if we can uh, uh, repeat that. So uh, uh, please welcome John Gibbs. Well, uh, thank you very much, John, for the introduction. And also, I think on behalf of everybody here, I'd like to, to welcome John. Uh, and his family uh, to Dublin. Uh, you're very welcome. I know you have many contacts here in Dublin, and I know you're at a, a, a family wedding, an extended family wedding at the weekend, so we're delighted that you're here. I think it's a wonderful uh, project because it's one thing to wonder what might happen in a world with vision or with visions, say, like. What we're seeing, I think, probably at the moment is more a world playing out where we don't have a vision, where our leaders, be they our politicians, our business people, our special interests, are acting very much for the short term, very much for the here and now. And what that leaves us with is that great gap, who speaks for it and who acts for the future. So when John presented me with the challenge uh, of uh, Visions 2100, um, I admit my reputation for possibly looking a little on the, on the darker side may have preceded me, so I, I, I took up the challenge and I put together a little piece that I called The Age of Madness. So, uh, here it goes, it's pretty short. It says, first, the good news. Against the odds, we made it to 2100. Only 50 years ago, it looked like it was game over for Homo sapiens. It sounds crazy now, but back in my grandparents' time, they really did carry on for a while like there was no tomorrow. Tearing down rainforests, flattening mountains, poisoning the seas, waging war on nature, all in pursuit of this strange idea they called growth. There aren't that many books now, but our teachers describe the age of madness, as they call it, when the scientific community repeatedly warned that Earth systems were in extreme danger. Nobody listened. Few chose to act. How could this have happened? Everyone, it seemed, was competing with everyone else for money, resources, status. No one seemed to notice that this spree couldn't continue indefinitely. Even the revelation back in 2015 that half of all the world's wild animals had been wiped out in the preceding 40 years failed to ring the alarm bells. And as for all the warnings about climate change, they all seem to be about someone else or some time in the future. Well, that future is now. This generation has learned the hard lessons of humility and hubris. 
There's barely 50 million of us now globally. Life is tough, but we're managing. This time, we're keeping it simple. They say the Earth is healing. Maybe they're right. Maybe we can at last live in a world where, in the words of the poet Seamus Heaney, hope and history rhyme. So that was my, uh, you, some people would say that a world population of 50 million by 2100 suggests that you're on the, the doomier end of the scale. I think, I believe, John, I wasn't the most. No, no, that was 50. Well, one person had 50. Five, zero. Yeah. Okay, so there you go. <laughs> I'm a million times more optimistic than some people. <laughs> So I think I think I, I introduced this by, by alluding to what happens with and without vision. And um, the late Nelson Mandela, I suppose, he, he put it quite nicely. He said that action without vision is only passing time. Vision without action is merely daydream. But vision with action can change the world. And who better than him to, to have actually put that into practice, at least in his part of the world. And I think we've seen very forcibly within the last few weeks, say in, in, the, in the, the Brexit vote in Britain, what happens when a clear vision is lost and what takes its place? All the, all the suspicion, the, the distrust, the breakdown that occurs when there is no clear agreed vision, when that societal glue, if you like, begins to come unstuck. I think we're also seeing it across the, the water in, in the western direction at the moment in ways that well, I suppose it remains to be seen how, how it plays out. Ireland, on the other hand, we, we, we really do, and I apologise for lapsing into more fortism, we genuinely do have a, a rich cultural heritage from things like literature, poetry, the arts, and probably, maybe it's because we're one of the few European countries that doesn't have the baggage, if you like, of a colonial heritage, that our voice as a small country does tend to travel well and we do get listened to. Now, usually I'd say that's a great thing. We Irish, we're brilliant. Everybody likes us, we know that. The other side of that is, and we've seen this, and Phil alluded to it a little bit earlier, Ireland can be very influential in the opposite direction. And for example, we have thoroughly, our government operating for, principally for vested interests, has thoroughly undermined the European Union's efforts at agreeing 2030 targets. I mean, we really have, as a small country, we have put the, 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 the spoke in the wheels of that progress. And all this to satisfy groups of people who are likely, including the agricultural community, to be the most impacted by climate change. And that, again, is what happens when we approach the future without vision, without a view, without a perspective, without taking the position that says, right, how will this affect me? What about my children? What about my grandchildren? What about two generations beyond those? If we're not thinking and acting for the future, for posterity, and we're simply spending down the resources of the earth right now as we see them, then what we have is a rudderless society that lacks vision and stumbles into the future. And that's a future that may well end up closer to the 50 that John alluded to than my thoroughly optimistic 50 million. But I just, I suppose, I was delighted to, to conclude. I was delighted to have been involved uh, and asked to participate. Uh, I'd recommend, if you haven't bought the book already, um, I'd recommend it. I think there's a wide range of views, disparate views, challenging views. You won't agree with, with them all, I think, but there's certainly something in there for, for, for everybody to argue about. And I do hope as well, as part of the discussion this evening, that we will you know, involve people within, within, the, within the room rather than just from the panel, so everybody can have their say. But thank you very much, John. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you, John. And um, I'd just notice that uh, John wasn't down to speak first, so I'm going to uh, <laughs> so press the button and see who I put down as the second slide, because I'm not entirely sure. Oh, no, that's, that's what I was going to do. I was going to show you that photo, John, as I was introducing you, I forgot. Oh, yes. Yeah, so um, that, that was uh, at the beginning. <laughs> that was at the beginning of, uh, uh, after, after the launch event. Uh, but it was, the, it was after the end, but before the evening got uh, got off, so uh, um, it was it was a fine evening in Paris. And um, so uh, next up we have um, Aideen O'Hara, O'Hara, sorry, um, who uh, I've known. I met this afternoon for the first time, but I've known for about five years. Um, and uh, Aideen used to run what was called the Greenway, and is now a Sustainable Nation. I was linked to merge into that, um, which is a very similar organisation to some of the stuff I do in uh, in Australia, and we've 
we tried to connect some companies through that. So um, please welcome me, Dean. Thanks, John, and you're very welcome to, to Dublin again, once again. Um, so, I suppose my uh, conversation is not so much about a vision for, for 2100, it's more to give a perspective on where we are now, and to give a sense of sometimes when you are looking so forward into the future, you also have to look back a little bit. So, seeing as we are at a good launch, if you like, I wanted to uh, do something that was uh, to look to literature to see was there somebody a little bit more eloquent than I in terms of the, 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 the moment we are in time. And there is a poem that was written not quite 100 years ago, but 80 years ago by uh, Patrick Padma, who will not be known for his optimism, but I have to say I am quite an optimistic person. But it does, I think, give a certain perspective. It's a poem called Epic. It's not a poem that I'm going to uh, read full of it, but there are certain passages within it that I think are hugely important to this conversation. It starts, I have lived in important places, times when great events were decided. Who owned that half root of rock in no man's land? That was the year of Munich's father, which was more important. Till Homer's ghost came whispering to my mind, he said, I met the idiot from such a local row, gods make their own importance. That is a really interesting background to this conversation we're having, because when we talk about climate change, when we talk about sustainability, we all have our own local perspective on the, the challenges that are there. So in Ireland as a country, we have a very parochial view of what climate change is. We talk about agriculture, we talk about the decisions our government make. They are very local to us, and I think when we are thinking about climate change, we have to take that more global perspective. And it's a conversation, it's a translational issue. So to some of John's points, it's a translational issue that it's very hard to have that conversation because the, the numbers are very hard for us to understand. So some of the challenges that are going to face us from a climate change perspective are demographic change. At the moment, we've had 4.7 million Syrians move from their uh, country. Climate change is going to mean a movement of 1 billion people. That's in addition to all the, 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 the millions that will die from climate change. So when we're looking to the future of 2100, we can't think of Ireland as Ireland and what we look at as a society now. We have to look at Ireland how will we accept this one billion of movement of people that are, that are going to come from sub-Saharan Africa <coughs> to Asia to the Southern Americas? The world is going to change and how can we as a Northern Hemisphere accept and cope with some of that? We're going to have, and the risk is eminent, there's 250 billion, uh, million people at risk from water shortages currently in Africa when we are at, then we experience the other extreme of flooding in Ireland. So again, it's very hard for us to, to, to understand what's going on and how climate change is having an effect. So when we talk about climate change, and I've been a practitioner for over 20 years, and I've worked in the private sector with corporates, I've worked in the government uh, and government agencies, I work with Sustainable Nation now, which is a coming together of public and private, a key thing that we try and do is how do we communicate this challenge and this issue? How do we translate it from what a CEO of a large corporate will understand to what a, a local citizen, somebody who's in the community, what they will understand? And it becomes very personal for each and one of those people. So if you're talking to somebody in a local community, they will have a very different perspective and that's for them. It's you know, it's being charged for water for the very first time that they can remember. It's uh, that their the, the flooding has happened, and they can't remember that field flooding since uh, maybe 40, 50 years. They can't remember snow as bad as 1947. So these are things that become very localised. But what I'm beginning to see in Ireland, certainly amongst a generation, my parents' generation they're seeing a change and they're actually beginning to have a conversation about climate change. And it's quite interesting at family functions, I mean completely ignored now when we talk, when everyone's talking about climate change, it's actually become part of the conversation. My 83 year old father, 
he's talking this climate change thing is actually real now and we see it and it's happening and I find that really fascinating that it's become the norm for people to accept that this is happening so I personally see a change but if we're to uh, I suppose in the optimistic tone I see a change but I'm also trying to influence a change and we work with a European organization called Climate Kick and we're working on two initiatives that I think are staggering. One is a, an initiative called Climate Launchpad, where we are working with 25 countries across Europe to identify the latest ideas that are going to solve the climate change challenge. And that's just fantastic. There are 800 ideas being developed into new companies and new propositions at the moment. And that's just absolutely fantastic. We're working on another idea called the Climate Fund which is we're going to take challenges that are affecting our community and our country and there are 80 cities around the country participating in that uh, event in October but there's 80 cities from around the world from Wellington in, in, in New Zealand from your part of the, your, the southern hemisphere to Vancouver in Canada all taking part in a challenge based initiative to see how can we respond to this change where some of this response, it does come back to how do we translate it into a model that will work on the ground that will be great. And that's the optimist in me, because I actually do think there are solutions out there. And there are solutions that, from a, a, a government and from a societal perspective, people and our governments will have to respond and listen. But governments will have to respond when, uh, I suppose, we have to, it's, it's uh, I suppose, within each of us to identify what some of those solutions are and it's up to our governments and to those within our public sector organisations to respond to those solutions and put them into place. But for all of this, it can only happen, I think, through a conversation. And every great idea starts with a conversation. I think events like this, John's book, it starts with a conversation and I think that's how we can begin a process of developing a partnership which is based on trying to understand the perspective from the other person and trying to change and influence that perspective for the better. So I suppose from my point of view I do think 2100 is going to be a very different society to what we have now. I think there's going to be a lot of change, there's no question about that. But I suppose my personal wish is that it's a society of acceptance, that as a race that we have globally uh, moved on from where we are at the moment, which is all against uh, pointing out each other's differences to now to looking to where there is acceptance as a society. And I do think that as something as a, a global society, it's something we're going to have to face very, very quickly, just given the movement of people and the rapid movement of people that's going to happen in the next, I would say, 10 to 20 years. And I think that's probably going to be one of our biggest challenges to, to face. So that's on that note. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. And uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm involved in some of the climate kick stuff in Australia as well, so we'll be, we'll be doing the climate film down there. And um, next up, Cara Augustenberg, um, who I met uh, going to the toilet about uh, half an hour ago. <laughs> Seemed quite strange, um, and uh, but but actually there's there's a, there's a couple of wonderful uh, YouTube videos of you in various other panels um, with Naomi Klein is one of them. That, that was great. I, I watched it all the way through. And I usually get bored and watching things. So uh, uh, so uh, if you're interested, go and find that. Um, uh, and I'm going to. Cara does all sorts of interesting things at UCD and at TCD, which is. Um, I'm not sure how you support in the rugby match, but uh, uh, I'll let Cara talk for herself now. Please welcome Cara. invited here tonight to participate in this Vision 2100. Um, I have to say it's a nice change because I come to the sciences and I spend a lot of time poring over uh, environmental science documents and, and policy documents and I only realized when I was doing this that this is the first time in a long time I actually got to use my imagination. So that was a, a nice change for me. But also, I can be honest about this now since all of you have to go and write your vision statement. I found writing my vision statement kind of intimidating. Um, I've done it before for 2050, which is only 34 years from now, and that's 
that's relatively easy for me to envision what the world will look like in, in another three decades. But you know, we're talking about over eight decades, and I will confess that I grew up before the internet. Uh, and in three decades since the internet has come on scene, our technology has changed and our entire society has changed as a result. So when I think about the world eight decades from now, I, I can't even fathom where technology will go and where society will go as a result of that. In doing some research for this, I started to look at space travel because I, I think that's coming down the pipeline. Um, and I even found a study out of the, uh, the University of Glasgow in the physics department that said by 2080, teleportation will be a reality for us. So um, that might deal with some of our aviation emissions issues or something. Um, so it seemed pretty crazy, and I couldn't even I couldn't even go there in terms of technology. But what I could do as an environmental scientist, the first thing I did was trying to figure out where will our climate go by 2100. And that in itself is a big challenge, because if you've read the Intergovernmental Panel or Committee on Climate Change, um, if you've read their, their forecasts, they look at a number of scenarios based on how our population will, will grow and peak and, and what kind of energy systems we'll use. And what they've predicted is that by 2100, we will see a warming of somewhere between 1.8 degrees Celsius from pre-industrial average temperature, that's best case scenario, to upwards of six degrees Celsius, um, which would be worst case scenario if we continue having energy systems that are dominated by fossil fuels. So if we look at that, six degree temperature rise, or near six degrees. Um, the last time we saw a temperature increase of, of that much was about 300 million years ago, and 95% of the species on Earth were wiped out as a result. So if I wrote a vision statement uh, based on that scenario, it would be pretty bleak and short, I think. Um, but I don't think we're, we're actually gonna head there. Um, when you look around the world, and, and I'll just show you some, some pictures from Al Gore's latest slide deck. So Al Gore does a great PowerPoint presentation and, and the first time I got to see this presentation was in 2013 when I trained with his climate reality project in Turkey. And the take home message I got from his images was that pretty much everywhere in the world is embracing renewables. And I actually felt at the time, oh my god, Ireland is really looking like a dinosaur here because we're, we're kind of behind the times in embracing this transition. Um, so I think the world is going to switch to a renewable energy dominated system. And as a result of that, I actually think that we're going to see a change in societal uh, equality too. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of good reasons to, to move over to a, a renewable energy system other than just climate. Um, I got this image, if you've ever seen uh, this video, it's called if, if the World Were 100 People. And it just does the demographics of the world if there were only 100 people in it. It's a really fun little short video. It talks about gender and literacy. Uh, and one of the things they mentioned is that if the world were 100 people right now, one person controls 50% of the wealth. That kind of inequality and that consolidation of wealth to a smaller and smaller group of people, I think it's reaching its limits. And we're seeing a lot of writing now about the death of neoliberalism and the limits to economic growth. And I think part of that transition to a renewable energy society will also be a change in our, our economic structures and our societal equality. Um, you can see it already in, in places in Africa, Bangladesh, these, these small scale uh, community power projects that are enabling development and, and the age of renewables is beginning as a city group said. So when I think about a world in 2100, I, I think that the future is going to be about localized environmental and social sustainability. I think that's part of the solution, the, the renewable energy solution. And, and I was trying to think about, did a community or a country exist right now that, that embraced that kind of philosophy? And the, the first thing that came to mind was actually Cuba. So Cuba is really interesting, particularly when it comes to food production. And food is something that I'm quite interested in uh, because I eat a lot of it. And also because I spent uh, my PhD at Chagas covered in cow manure for three years. So it's a very <laughs> special interest of mine. But, but what Cuba's done with, with food is, is fascinating because they were limited by a, a lack of fossil fuels, so they couldn't transport uh, food very long distances. 
And as a result of that, they had to create urban agriculture. So the food is grown where people live, and it's sold where people live. So they have very short transport distances. Uh, they have farmers markets that are open uh, 12 hours a day, seven days a week, all over these urban communities. And also they were limited in that they didn't have a lot of agrochemicals and they didn't have a lot of fertilizer. So 80% of food grown in Cuba is organic. And inadvertently, as a result of this political isolation, they've created this sustainable food production system where organic, locally available food happens to be the, the cheapest, most convenient food for the population. So um, I think that's the way we all need to go in our food production systems if we're really serious about sustainability. Another interesting thing about Cuba is that uh, one, an individual, only an individual can own a business. So you don't get corporations or chains which means that all the businesses are very uh, locally focused and community oriented. But if, you're, if you've been reading about Cuba lately, the markets are opening up, and the greatest threat to that localized model is actually this consumerism dream that, that Cubans have watched on TV and think that we're all living when in fact only 20% of the world is living that kind of, that consumerist dream, and the rest of them are, are suffering as a result of it. So. Um, when I was thinking about 2100, I thought, actually, I, I want to flip this around. I want the world to realize that that consumerist dream is a pipe dream, and that we're chasing the wrong dream. And that the dream we need is a dream about equality, it's about connectedness, it's about health and well-being. Um, and that was what my, my vision statement is based on. So overall, I would say that my vision, which I'll read to at the end here, is, is a mix of regret and optimism, which probably sounds like a contradiction. but. It's regret because I'm an environmental scientist and I couldn't ignore the fact that the world has already warmed one degree above our pre-industrial temperatures and that we're already experiencing the impacts of climate change right now. And I couldn't ignore the fact that even if we turned off all the fossil fuel taps today and stopped burning fossil fuel, we've locked in a further 0.6 degrees of warming based on our actions to date and the fact that the atmosphere responds in kind of delay. Uh, which means, if, if you know anything about Bangladesh and the Maldives and Tuvalu, um, all of them have said that anything above 1.5 degrees uh, of warming above pre-industrial baseline is too much for them to bear because of sea level rise. So even uh, at the stage we're at now, we can expect that those countries will struggle. So I think we should have some regret in not having acted fast enough to prevent that. But I'm also uh, still an optimist. I haven't joined the Doomsters yet. <laughs> So it's getting harder and harder with the Trumps and the Brexits of the world. Um, but at the, at the moment, I'm still an optimist. And so, so as an optimist, I also felt that I, I'm seeing signs of global change. You know, people want change, not climate change, but, but system change. And I think any of you who had the privilege of, of attending COP21, you might recognize some of yourselves in that picture there. Um, you saw it too on the streets of Paris and on the streets around the world. People of every age group are calling for big changes in, in the way our wealth is divided, in the way we run our societies, and I think that there are benefits to the climate as a, as, as a result of that. So I think that the next eight, by in the next eight decades, a just society will prevail because people power, in terms of weight and volume, it outnumbers corporate power. So this is my for 2100. We waited too long to act. By mid-century, climate change and its tragic consequences were inevitable. Saharan heat waves swept across the Mediterranean. Super hurricanes became the norm. Glaciers melted and their fresh water was lost. Seas rose and maps were redrawn. People were forced to migrate and cities became crowded. But we prevailed and learned from the mistakes of our forebears. Eventually, we defeated corporate fossil fuel powers and decarbonized our energy and transport systems, an admirable feat that united the world and empowered civil society. By 2100, we achieved a higher level of human development than the materialistic dreams of our ancestors, which only ever came true for a privileged minority. Our society is no longer dominated by the acquisition of monetary wealth and goods, but based on connectedness, health, education, equality, and well-being. We learned that as systems got bigger, corruption and waste seeped in. 
Rather, we localize and we encourage self-reliance. Food grows where it's eaten, people shop and work where they live, in contrast to the soulless commuter belts and urban sprawl of our past. Both physically and psychologically, we have grown up instead of out. Thank you. Thank you, Cara. I love the, uh, the last bit, the last words, growing, growing up instead of out. So it's, uh, <coughs> Um, so our last um, speaker is, is Alex White, a, a barrister and politician, and, and from Australia, I've got to say, I, I've never heard of you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really, really sorry, it's probably good to hear you. Um, but, but I was at a family wedding over the weekend and, um, uh, and, and met my, my small Irish family, and uh, my, my 18-year-old son at the back there is... Um, uh, met 200 relatives he didn't know existed um, and uh, had a great time. Um, but, uh, but they all spoke very highly of you. Maybe not all 200, but quite a few of them. They said, oh, Alex, like, he's, a, he's one of the good guys. So, um, so it's, it's great to have you here and to meet you. And I, I met Alex um, about five minutes ago as, uh, as I sat down with something. So um, uh, please um, welcome Alex. And, um, Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me down the back? Yeah. I might just uh, dispense with the microphone if that's okay, but if, uh, if I, my voice trails off and you want me to use the microphone, please tell me to do that. Just, as I'm the guy in the suit, it seems. <laughs> and, you know, there's actually a point to that. Um, not about the fact that I'm wearing the suit, but just about the broader context of everything that we're discussing here this evening. Just first of all, just to tell you who I am. I'm not known in Australia, I know that. I'm not sure how well I'm known in this audience, but I'll just briefly uh, say that until May of this year, I was Minister for Communications, Energy and Natural Resources. Um, I'm a long-standing member of the Labour Party. Um, my party didn't do too well in the election, certainly not as well as the uh, Labour Party did in Australia, although they didn't manage to get back into government, uh, pretty close. But I spent a, almost two years as Minister uh, dealing with energy policy, and not with responsibility for the, the policy on climate change, which has now come into that department, but I did have for energy policy. Prior to that, I was in the Department of Health for a similar period, about two years. I'm a practicing barrister now. Uh, I'm back doing what I was doing for the 20 years or so before I became a politician. Uh, so I'm taking a break from politics, perhaps a very long break, I don't know. That'll be up to other people. But the interesting thing from my point of view, the really you know, striking uh, thing for me, having been asked to think for the purpose of this seminar about the future and how I view the future, is how I changed as an individual in terms of my knowledge and insight and understanding of this whole agenda from a period of, you know, a short period of years uh, in government. And, you know, I used to meet John for coffee. I think, you know, we met a half a dozen times while I was minister. And I'm not going to describe John as dudes or anything else because I don't think that's, that's fair to him, actually. But I will say this, that when we used to have coffee at our lunch, whatever it was, uh, for an hour, an hour and a half, fantastic uh, conversation, really insightful uh, um, stuff from John. I was strolled back up to the department that I was in charge of, and actually, I have to say, into a different world. So into a world, a department which until certainly a decade ago, perhaps even more recently, saw its pretty much its sole objective as the fostering and expansion of oil and gas exploration uh, off the coast uh, of Ireland into government rooms where I had interaction with colleagues in agriculture, we spoke with agriculture, and other areas of government policy that, you know, to say the least of it, need to be pushed on in order to align with what we're talking about this evening. Into my own party rooms and those of other parties where there, I have to say, is, a little, I won't say no, but little enough appreciation of the critical importance of this agenda. And that's the world that I've been in, you know, for the last four years. Coming into it as a lawyer, as somebody who had a reasonable level of motivation and understanding about, about climate change and the, uh, the, the necessary changes that uh, we have to make in our society, in our economy, in our world. But really, I suppose then, as a minister, understanding not just the level and scale of the uh, policy changes that are needed, but, and this touches on John's, I think, whole point here, the challenge of how you persuade and how you change minds and how you bring people with you. 
And that's kind of my point about the suit. You know, I think most of us in this room, I won't, make, I won't assume what people's views are in here, but I don't think a lot of people in this room need to be persuaded, broadly speaking, of what we're talking about. There's an awful lot of people in our society, as we all know here, do need to be persuaded. And that's why I'm struck by what John said at the outset about emotion and fear and the rational and the emotional. As a politician, a, a practicing politician for a number of years, you do get to understand and, and uh, experience the frustration of uh, you know, knowing that the rational argument, at least as you see as a rational argument from your political perspective, doesn't travel very far unless it's you know, understood and it's actually felt by people in their true living everyday experiences. And I think that is at the heart of what we uh, are, are talking about this evening and what we need to understand. And I mean, in the, in the years that I was in the, in, had the energy brief, I, I came across an enormous number of people across the country, in business, in academia, in community groups, all the way across the country were really immensely, and I was struck by what Aideen said, it, you know, motivated and interested and understand that there, you know, things need to be done and the world needs to change. Um, but they are suffering from a lack of political leadership. I think we all are. And I think that, you know, the, the, the sort of, um, I would describe it as sort of a sense in, in our political system, broadly speaking, of kind of benign procrastination is really how people it. Not that people reject the need to make changes, but that as John has said, he said it to me before, it's for somebody else some other time at some other stage in the future. And, you know, that's the critical uh, uh, question, I think, for all of us. How we actually get out of rooms like this, and I think, by the way, don't denigrate for a second, the importance of having you know, groups of people who are intensely informed and motivated, you go nowhere without that. But you also don't really go anywhere until we start to step outside the milieu that we're in ourselves and seek to persuade and seek to uh, understand what the obstacles and what the drawbacks are. And I spent about, a, about, about not a year, perhaps the best part of the year, writing this document, white paper, Ireland's transition to a low carbon energy future. And that was an extremely interesting experience as well. Because that was actually talking across the system to people who resisted change in some cases, who would sometimes offer, again, a benign version of a yes minister approach that it was important and that you were very brave and all of those things that we saw, yeah, but that, you know, perhaps not quite that quickly and this would be something that we should look at in the fluxion of time when it became necessary and so on. And the critical job for me, I think, was persuading the system and persuading colleagues and persuading colleagues in government that it isn't actually just about, if I may put it this way, to 2100 if you like, or 2050 or 2030. Because in a curious sort of way, and I'll come back to, to the, the vision thing in a second, the, the longer the distance is away that the thing has to be achieved, even if it's 2030, the more alibis people have to do nothing or to do very little. And I struggle with this notion of th th this sort of you know, balance between communicating the real dangers and threats that are there on the one hand, and they're real and they're manifest, and we've got to explain them and constantly re uh, uh, repeat it. But that on the one hand, and actually persuading people that it is possible to do something about it. But the bigger you make the problem, in, in, on one view anyway, the bigger you make the problem, sometimes the harder you make it to persuade people to come with you and to engage in change. And there's a real struggle I still have. I'm not sure quite how, how we resolve it. One of the ways we've resolved it, it's not unique to me or to us, was to try to capture this sense of a transition so that there's incremental, that there's change all the time. Not one big moment at some point uh, in 10 years' time or 15 years' time. I might be here, or some of us might be here, and we talk about our children all the time and our grandchildren, they have to do it. That there is, a, we allocate work to all of us immediately and that we're doing it from, from that we're doing it now, and we continue to do it uh, in an accelerated way into the future. 
And you know, even the, the, the 2100, I, I remember going on Morning Ireland the morning after this was published, or sorry, the day it was, it was to be published. And the interviewer, in, in the normal way, they probably scanned it just for, I don't know, 20 seconds, I don't know how long he gave it. But he saw mention of 2030, he saw mention of 2050, and he saw mention of 2100. And he actually said to me, in a very sneering way, how do you even say 2100? How do you even say that? No, it's kind of funny, but on the other hand, it actually gives you, a, it gives you a sense of how you're greeted sometimes with this, with these kinds of issues, even in, in the, even in, in the sort of more amenable media, uh, like RTE. So, big, big, big uh, question. But the, you know, I, I can come back to this, this this sense of a transition. And a very senior official said to me lately, uh, not in the department I was in, but a senior person in this field, in this sector said to me, if you, if you only achieve one thing, and this, you may not find this very exciting, what he said, but I want to give you a sense of what other people who are amenable to what needs to be done, what they think. He said, if you only achieve one thing, you got that title out, Ireland's transition to a low carbon energy future. And he was more or less saying, if there was nothing between, if there was nothing there, you got, the, you got that established in the system as a transition. And as I said, I, didn't, I don't think anybody here be that excited. You think that's very minimalist. But understand the scale of the problem that we have in our political system and in our broader society here. The, the, the notion of change and the necessity for change is complete. There's no alignment whatever with the political or the electoral cycle. So there's little or no incentive for politicians across the board to take any real interest uh, in doing something now in terms of actually you know pushing a political agenda now because again it's back to this it's about the future it's certainly after the next election uh, it's, it's it's way down the road so anyway i go from one one uh, point to another i suppose the the, 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 the main message that i i want to and um, a few other things but i wrap up because i'm sure i'm going well over 10 minutes i just want to endorse what johnson but all of the speakers actually said that the response needs to be, in this country as much as anywhere else, a real national engagement that goes beyond the rhetoric of what I've said, the rhetoric of this benign procrastination that currently obtains right across the political spectrum, with some uh, very few exceptions. That engagement will, you know, cannot be sporadic. It will have to be continuous. It will have to transcend the electoral cycle uh, because it must do so because it must do so. Uh, it will, yes, have to recognize, you know, the many threats and dangers associated with climate change, but it will also have to recognize the real and lasting opportunities that are there to build a better world. It would recognize that in order to change our behavior, to change our behavior, we all need to see and understand, if we're, we admit, we have, if we're honest with ourselves, we all have to see and understand the potential that exists for improving our own material circumstances. Because that's the way most people think. We we'll have to recognize that as well as the broader you know, imperative of saving our planet. And it will only succeed if it's a great national project. One that, yes, everybody believes is necessary, because that's the first part of the job, persuading people is necessary, but you also have to persuade people that it's achievable. Because if people think something isn't achievable, it gets confined to the realms of the fanciful, I'm afraid. Even if people won't admit that, that's the way they will actually react in their heads and in their minds. Alex, and, uh, and I think my relatives are probably right. They're probably one of the good guys. So that's, uh, <laughs> that's good. Um, now we've got a, we've got a bit of time for uh, some questions from the audience. Um, feel free to uh, disagree, argue, uh, maybe not the you know not throw things, but uh, but uh, make, make any points. Has any, anyone got any comments or, uh, or questions you'd like to ask there here? Perhaps. Can do that. Thank you. Um, I suppose so you just say who you are and where you're from. Yeah. Mark Bennett, I used to be the Green Business Officer for Dublin City Council. Um, just because 
I got used to calling him Minister Alex Pfeiffer because Alex Pfeiffer is the last to speak for stuff. I would say that one of the things that maybe the other, because this is what happens, is it becomes very polarizing debate. When you're talking about benign you know, procrastination, and of course we know it's not really benign because it has a very active result, which is that the people who are concerned end up being the shouty people on the outside trying to make the system change. And I wonder, do you, you know, you, I thought that was an excellent process that you did on the transition paper. I think it was an exemplar of how government should be dealing with you know, multiple stakeholders, not just citizens, but also businesses. But is there any hope of that becoming more prevalent, or is there an even better way that I haven't heard of yet? Never. Um, well, I think there is, I mean, there is hope of, of, of that uh, you know, kind of approach continuing and uh, being enhanced. And I don't know if you're asking about some of the elements of the white paper, for example, one of the elements was, is that there would be, that we would establish an energy forum so that the kind of discussion, debate, um, sharing of evidence, <coughs> testing of evidence, public demonstration of things that are, you know, that the arguments that are made are in fact true and aren't just the things of people, people's uh, uh, imagination. And this engagement that we need, that there will be a forum for that to happen. I saw in the program for government, this new government, a, a slightly different take on that, where they say in the program for government that there will be, the, uh, uh, to expand on the energy forum. It's, it's the first time I ever saw something proposed to be expanded on that never actually got off the ground because it was only, we only published the thing in, in, uh, um, just before Christmas. So the energy forum was the idea. It was, we, I was hopeful that it would, it, would, it would convene this month in July, is what the plan was. But in fairness, like, you know, the government's now talking about a national dialogue on climate action that would have this continue, you know, it wouldn't just be a once-off, that would actually ha have a presence, have a public presence uh, uh, into the future. Um, I just looked before, uh, this morning, when I was thinking about this evening, um, uh, what Dennis Nocton and Simon Coveney said last week about the National uh, um, Dialogue and Climate Action. They said it should, they want to see him having a wider focus than the Energy Forum. That's okay. So long as a wider focus doesn't mean you widen it so much that you're knocking around for ages to try to get it started. But that it would consider, you know, um, issues such as uh, key infrastructure, uh, land use, security of supply, and economic issues. That's a quote. That would also be included. so. I, I'm not sure what, what they all what, what that would all amount to, but I'm going to I'm going to be glass half full, and I'm going to operate on the basis that this thing can happen and needs to happen, and all of us together need to push and make sure that it does happen. Thank you. Yeah. Here. Hi everyone, my name is Adrian Adopti, I'm a researcher at the ECB School of Business and um, thank you all for your presentations, they're fascinating. Um, I have a question for all the panel, same question, and it's about the realisation of your visions for 2100. Um, so for all of you, what's the single most important thing that you would like to see happening now in 2016 that would sort of contribute to the realisation of your vision? He's going first. Okay, okay. Thanks for that. That's a great question. Uh, I would say, um, having briefly dipped my toe into politics back in 2014, um, what I'd love to see is, is far more political activism from the population on climate because uh, we always hear politicians saying it's not a doorstep issue, it's not going to get into votes. Um, and I just would love to see all of Ireland telling their politicians that you know, the most important thing for them is climate action. I know that would be um, difficult, but I mean, even if just more people would say that at the doors and really push for it, I think it would, it would change the dynamics on the issue. Sure, here we go. Yeah, um, I think what I'd love to see, or where I'd love to see it start from, is to realize that while we're, we're, in, a, we're in a jam or in a pickle, that the solution of the solutions to climate change are also the solutions to a whole bunch of other really dreadful things that are happening. Uh, biodiversity loss, um, species extinction, um, the, the essentially one species running the natural world, the entire natural world. We may have 20 million species in the world, we may have 
hundred million species. We don't even know, but we're putting them out of business that quickly in that in that time. And for me, I think we we as the dominant species in the world today, what I'd love to see happen is for us to, you know, since we're in control, we need to start behaving like it. We need to actually start taking responsibility rather than just taking stuff. There's so many things I'd like to see happen, but I think it is about action, and I think government has to lead by example. And I would have said in my intro, I've worked for an estate agency in NCAI, and I've worked on public sector contracts, I've done all of that, and I actually think one of the things government needs to do is lead by example in terms of issuing its own public procurement contracts. So at the moment, sorry, at the moment, what's your business? At the, at the moment, um, it, public sector contracts are issued by you know, who has the cheapest offer on the table, and to a degree that's fine, but I think we need to pre-qualify for a lot of the public procurement tenders to look at who is doing something on sustainability uh, and incorporate those issues, and then they can get through to the next round, which is based on cost. But I think government has to lead by example. Put in projects of scale, you know, we issued the paper last week, um, I can't recall the, the right name of it, but building 25,000 new uh, social homes. And, you know, we really do need to see sustainability built into that, which will uh, protect against uh, climate change. And I think that's actually the first thing we, we need to do. Yeah. And my answer is a bit of a version of what I've already said about, about the about the.